Hello, folks. Can you all hear me or is there a really bad echo? Hello, no echo. Yes, I was having a bad echo yesterday and I had, and then today I, I still have the same setup and here we are with no echo. It's weird how technology works. <laughs> or, doesn't, or doesn't work. Yeah, like I didn't do anything yesterday. That's like the worst part when you're like, I touched nothing. <laughs> As I always say, someday I really want to see a Star Trek where they like <laughs> dial up the aliens on the Enterprise and the captain is like, hello, can you hear me? And the alien is like, what, what? Are you speaking? <laughs> oh, there, there's an episode. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, he pulled that once. Can, can, can in the, in the original series. Yeah. Can, can you try uh, turning your comm system uh, off and back on again? Yeah. Hey, what? I'm just going to jump in and out of warp, and we'll see if that clears it up. <laughs> we'll wait like one minute, um, maybe less, for other folks to join, and then we'll get started. Where the heck is Steven? There we go. Josh or Steven, you're also going to take it away at the uh, zero hour mark while I ghost out of here to another meeting. It's cool, cool. But we have some Container D folks on the call with us today. And Yay! Hello. Um, welcome to the Container D folks. Um, uh, Derek, as I mentioned uh, on our last call, came to contributor uh, contributor growth working group and was just kind of like, what's this about? And we talked for a while uh, and we got here. So um, welcome. Um, let me summarize and then Derek, what I want to do, um, actually, let's just do a round of intros because we like always usually know each other in this group. So we don't do intros anymore. <laughs> um, but I think that's actually important now that we have half of y'all have not been here before. So, um, I'll start. My name is Paris. I work at Apple. I do this cool, fun stuff for projects with help with governance and contributor strategy. Josh, who are you? What do you do? I'm Josh Burkus. I work for Red Hat in our OSPO. Um, and I got involved with this because um, among my many interests, I'm a governance geek, um, starting with the Open Office project back in 2001. Steven. Steven. Hello, hello. Hey, I'm uh, Steven Augustus, uh, primarily focused in the Kubernetes community. So do governance -y things for a few places there. I'm also a Dex maintainer and generally interested in uh, just how communities get together and work efficiently. So I thought this was a natural uh, step. Nasty. Hello. Sorry. I didn't see um, you on the telephone. Hey. My bad. A, um, I'm April. <laughs> I'm multitasking and not doing it well. Um, and uh, I am on the Google Open Source Programs Office, and I work a lot with gRPC, which is a lovely CNCF project that everyone should love. It has an adorable mascot named Pancakes. Yes. The mascot is phenomenal. Uh, Carolyn. Hi, I'm uh, Carolyn Van Slyke. Um, I work at Microsoft. I used to work uh, on Kubernetes a bit. Now um, I work in the broader community working on uh, CNAB, Cloud Native Application Bundles, um, and Porter, which was just submitted to CNCF. Um, and I'm here mostly because I usually end up writing and doing a lot of the contributor growth activities on any project I'm on. So I just have lots of opinions. <laughs> They're good opinions. Um, all right, let's see. And then now we're getting into the Container D team. Derek. Hi, I'm Derek McGowan. I'm a software engineer at Apple. I'm a maintainer on Container D for a while now. I also 
do some other stuff on like uh, OCI as well. Sebastian? Hi, I'm uh, Sebastian. I work at Docker. Uh, mostly work on the Docker engine. Also help maintaining Container D and whatever open source I can find my <laughs> to get my hands on. Oh, that's cool. Hey, Sebastian. Uh, and then Mike, and then that wraps us up. Hello, I'm a maintainer on Container D. Uh, did a lot of the original work with Lantau on the CRI functionality that's in Container D now. Uh, it'll be a default plugin. Uh, it, we're integrating it into Container D, Container D in, in the 1.5 release. I worked on operating systems. That blue screen of death behind Sebastian, I did some work on that. <laughs> As an IBM, I worked, I worked on OS, OS2, OS3, NNT, the original version. Um, so you'll find my name down in that deep bowels of that code. <laughs> well, welcome, Mike. All right. Thanks, everyone, for doing that. We never really do that because uh, it's usually just us, the, the, first, the first half of that crew. Um, so the summary that I took away, and Derek, I want you to actually take it away from me, is um, y'all want some help with contributor growth topics, but specifically in some of these areas, uh, one, role identification and building. Sounds like you also have some probably roles already in mind, maybe even um, have, you know, have built off that from the last time we talked. Um, and then also uh, community management strategy and goals to maybe help the help maintainers out figuring out how to actually um, sustain that part of the function and then ultimately the outreach for that said thing. So whether remember we talked about whether or not it's like a, a group of people to help out with community management, a person, some kind of like strategy and or goal setting there. Did I summarize that right? Yeah, I, th I think that's accurate. I, th I think in the past, Container D's had some of that, but as yeah. people have kind of moved on and as even the maintainers have like switched to different companies and stuff, like we haven't had like a full-time community manager in a couple years. And yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to like keep up with like other projects and stuff, especially as a graduated project, like keeping the same level of visibility. Yeah, for sure. And talk, so actually um, go into the past a little bit. So you said at one point you had a full time. So one point full time. Um, what were some of the other things that you maybe used to have as far as the community management side that you don't necessarily have anymore? Well, I, th I think a lot of the roles we have today, just even just like interfacing with CNCF and like organizing, like who's speaking at different conferences and the different like speaking opportunities, um, like keeping track of the people who are coming in and interested in Container D and like mapping them to either the right people or like helping them like get started and stuff. Like all that stuff's been done directly by the maintainers, um, which it's, it's kind of hard sometimes, like stuff like falls through the cracks or like we okay. really have to be on top of things. So. You said social media too, I think at one point, right? Like you're, y'all are doing your own tweets and stuff like that too, right? Yeah, I, I do most of the, the, the Twitter work, um, if the you call Twitter. that work, but. <laughs> <laughs> you like it, don't fit. Uh, yeah, that's fun. Right. That's fun. <laughs> all right, and then it, let's go into a little bit more of the background around the roles. Do you, ha and because um, I can't remember from the conversation that we had before, do you currently have any other roles identified outside of like the standard, whether it's maintainer or what have you? Do you have any, tell, tell us a little bit about the roles that you have. Yeah, so we have three roles today. So we have maintainers, we have reviewers, and we have a new security advisors role. Um, the reviewers and maintainers are the more active roles. Um, so the, the difference really is just uh, maintainers are almost like part of our governance process in terms of like voting on issues um, and then actually like with right access for doing merges um, but otherwise like the roles are pretty much the same so like it's just the act the active part is just reviewing code most for both of those roles um, but yeah those are the only roles we have identified today <clears throat> I have about 800 more questions, so I'm actually going to open it to everybody else, though. So uh, anybody else want to dig into either these two areas, either asking questions or either offering suggestions or advice? 
Um, so yeah, I'd love to know like what's working or what isn't working today. It sounds like you have some new roles. Um, how long have you had the roles? Are they doing what you intended? Um, and are there places where we could offload or where you could offload work from that's classically defined in one of those roles into a new role? I mean, I think my goal is that I, I want to have a lot more reviewers. So we've, we've added the reviewer role um, for about a year or so. I don't know, Sebastian, you may know better about when we added that, but uh, we've tried to grow that number because um, that's, that's really like what allows our project to scale in terms of like review and uh, especially a project like container D, something that's really low and has high stability requirements. We want as many people kind of looking at each of those pull requests as possible, even for the small things. Um, so that that's one of the things that I, I think we could do better at. Um, and the other is just like, I think, kind of at the project management level and just, um, so for example, like uh, there was some issue around not having like a security MD in like our container D project, even though we had, it's like a GitHub requirement, um, even though we had kind of listed like, oh, here's how you list things. There was some issue where somebody was trying to file something, um, they couldn't buy, find it. Um, and CNCF actually kind of got involved and said like, hey, you need to have this like specific file and stuff like that. And as maintainers just like, oh, okay, sure. Like we don't know like, or we don't really care too much like how stuff's like laid out from like a, like a GitHub perspective, but if that kind of stuff's like important, um, like we need to know about that kind of stuff and like preferably have that stuff proactive. Like if somebody, as some like requirements for how that stuff is laid out, like uh, something that was like known to us. Right, we're not actively engaged in finding the new check marks that we're supposed to be filling in, right, in container D. So we're missing that level of communication. Right. Additional requirements to be a, a CNCF, right, maintained project. I think for the reviewers part, and that's something I see in many repositories is that I think the occasional visitor of a repository uh, considers the actual maintainers to be responsible for doing the reviewing. And I think in general it is, people should be, become more aware that basically anyone should be able to review whatever repository. I mean, it's open source, so input is always welcome. And input is welcome. I, yeah. I, I guess if you get more people that are aware of that and maybe you get involved into, in that, you can also pick actual reviewers out of that as to, hey, this person is a great reviewer. Uh, I've seen a couple of reviews of this, this person on some random pull requests. And I trust this person to be doing actually proper, proper review, but getting that message out, maybe one thing that I think could help the project. Do you have documentation on how to do a review for Container D? That's a great one. Uh, Derek? <laughs> no, I don't you? think we have no. anything other than just say review. <laughs> yeah, we, we generally make sure that the, the people that are, you know, getting the review tag um, have that capability already, as opposed to, right. you know, give, giving them a set of instructions on how to make it there, right? Um, yeah. Although we do give a lot of individual, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one kind of efforts to try to get people to review stuff or maintain our stuff. Um, we also have um, what, I don't know if Derek mentioned, we, we have experimental projects that are, you know, non-core projects, you know, sub-projects that are extending and enhancing Container D, but haven't, you know, been brought into the main, main core set. And in those, we have their own maintainers. Um, they're, they're not core maintainers, they're sub-project maintainers, sort of like Kubernetes, you know, SIGs and, inf you know, infra type stuff, type projects. So, so a few questions falling out of that um, to, to um, kind of tag on to what Josh was saying. Um, documentation is huge. Uh, contributor documentation, if people, uh, things are a lot more accessible if people uh, are given explicit instructions on how to do them. Um, 
two uh, would be a question on how you select reviewers in the first place. Is it just kind of, because sometimes it's like, you know, finger in the air, like they, they've been doing stuff for a while and it probably seems like the right time. Um, but having explicit in instructions about how to become a, a reviewer would be good too. Um, and then uh, you mentioned one-on-one -on -one sessions and um, I think I think all of us do one-on-one -on -one sessions to some extent, um, but something that we've uh, we've seen to be pretty successful in the Kubernetes community and and Paris is the the queen of this is exactly what she just said in the uh, in the group chat um, video your, yourself doing a review or or doing one of those one-on-one -on -one sessions and make that available on uh, some YouTube playlist, right? That that becomes mm -hmm. you know that <laughs> scalable, right? Because every time you get a new request for, um, hey, we were wondering about foo right record a video on foo and then put it up on a, on a playlist right and that's you answering the question for however many right people now, do, now out, to, be, right? Be, to be fair we do have documentation to describe for you know coming on developers and documenters how how they can how they can make modifications and changes and review stuff um, and we yeah. do also have uh, contributing guidelines um, for the project uh, it's just not you know to the level of detail that you were asking about Consider uh, well, this like layer two of project maturity level contributor documentation. I think that's the that's the way you have to look at it now. Like you've grown to this level of contributor documentation as a project, and now you need to grow into the other layer. And that other layer is the like the documentation for your reviewers and for your approvers and for your maintainers. And, stuff and, like that. and the reason I was asking that is just that. Uh, the documentation serves an important purpose beyond instructing people, um, almost instead of instructing people, because realistically, it's hard to cover everything somebody might need to know in terms of doing an actual review. But if you have a piece of documentation that says, here is how you as a contributor can do a review, that clues people into the fact that they can do a review, if you follow me, because your biggest barrier to getting more reviewers is that even people who contribute code to Container D don't think that they are qualified to be a review. Yep, agreed. Yeah, I, th I think having more documentation around that is, is definitely one of the things we're looking to get guidance from, from this group, especially because like, uh, I mean, the, the documentation we know works for the people who are involved, but we don't have kind of a good sense all the time, especially like trying to step out and looking at that from the outside. Like we know our documentation is not great, but we're not quite sure how to fix it on both like a process and like a technical level. I think um, like it's kind of like the cart before the horse. You don't want to do the out. <laughs> Mike clearly, Mike was the culprit on that. I was like looking at everybody that like. <laughs> No, just kidding. Uh, I feel like before, like before we do the outreach that you need the people, like we should have at least some of the skeleton documentation so that like while we're, when we're doing these mega outreach efforts that say like, oh, Container D is looking for new reviewers, um, they'll have something to like go towards and be guided to. So um, from a documentation standpoint, I really think that like videos at this point are going to be your best friend because it's stuff that you're already doing and already in your flow whereas like the writing of it is probably like the more difficult piece um and you would always link to your youtubes and stuff from your technical documentation inside of your contributor guide and whatnot so i think that's like from my opinion i feel like that's where you should start is like, what do I do? Like internalize it kind of like, what do I do as a reviewer, right? right? Like what do I do as an, a, as an improver that's any different than Sally down the street who's a contributor, right? And, Go ahead. I, I would say depending on your technique, like not uh, everyone is a visual learner or a visual teacher, I guess. Um, so even before doing the videos, if you want to step back and say like, what does my day look like, right? If I'm reviewing a PR for container D, if I'm like doing maintenance uh, work, right? Like, what does that look like? Do I, do I stare at the, do I stare at a project board first, right? Do I do some GitHub queries? Do like, what's, what's your process, right? 
even before you get to the point of like reviewing a PR, right? And start to, and, and then look at your documentation and say, is that documented, right? Because um, those could be gaps that people could potentially be filling. A lot of the, the times um, we find that a, that is an excellent, uh, that is an excellent, excellent uh, video. Um, Tim Hawkins, uh, how to be a badass code reviewer um, to take a look at. Um, so recently in SIG release in Kubernetes, we brought on a program manager. Um, and it's something that we have been uh, sorely lacking, <laughs> to say it nicely. I think it's it's one of the first times that we've done a explicitly named role like that in the community. And uh, so Lori Apple has been just jumping everywhere and identifying like things that we take, you know, like we make assumptions on, we make huge assumptions on, and it's just because they're part of our day-to-day -day workflow. Like as an improver or as a, as a SIG chair, I'm going to do certain things, right? That may be happening in the background. Like if it's, if it's sorting project boards, if it's adding new milestones, if it's, you know, pinging this person via DM to make sure that they're doing X, right? We have to come back and say like, is that stuff documented, right? And it, and it may feel Feel like it's um, it's a lot of the work that could be done by other people is assumed work, right? It's work that you're already doing and isn't written down anywhere. So I would I would I would step back and maybe have a, a maintainers meeting and just think about like what you do day to day and see if it's documented. So Yeah, makes sense. Um, yeah, discussing this with within or kind of within the maintainer group. Um, yeah, it's 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 definitely hard, like getting everybody together, especially with like recently with like time stuff. Like, but yeah, I understand. There's no like quick recipe for some of these, but we just want to figure out like a good place we can we can start and make some early progress. Anyone else have questions for, I, I do. So that's why I don't, I just don't want to take the, the floor. So other questions for ContainerD folks? Well, one of the things it sounds like is a major need is that um, you need to attract some volunteer contributor management uh, advocacy, whatever contributors. That is, these are things that used to be done by paid staff from some company or another. They're no longer done by paid staff. And and now you need to figure out how to get somebody to volunteer to do it. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. We, we don't necessarily need people coming in just contributing a bunch of code. I mean, mm -hmm. or at least like code contributions and code review should scale. But like, yeah, right now, I think one of the biggest lacks is yeah, not necessarily those code contributions, but those other forms of like the technical contributions and uh, helping with the process and stuff. I think that's right. Uh, so, okay. The, um, have you put out any kind of a call for that um, on like your user forum, mailing list, Slack channel, whatever it is? What is it anyway? Uh, no, not explicitly. I mean, we have, we have Slack, um, and Twitter. We don't even have a mailing list. Uh, yeah. Well, and people have all kinds of different channels. So I feel like the community, whoever, whoever is helping out with community could also help out with that as well. Like the channel, channel development and communication development and stuff like that. Um, all right. Uh, this is Phil. Sorry, I, I stayed quiet while I was on the phone because I didn't know how good or bad my connection was going to be. But oh, sorry, no, I thought that was April who was also on the phone, and I didn't. <laughs> oh I didn't no, no problem at all. No problem at all. <laughs> but um, just kind of, I, I think this may fit here. I, but you know, Container D is an interesting project because there, I feel like there aren't as many people all that interested in contributing, but who love to play around with it as an API driven container runtime. And so, I, you know, even our user base is like kind of fragmented as a negative word, but I don't mean it that way. But, 
you know, there's a, there are a ton of people who just use container D because it's a CRI pluggable runtime and they really don't care. It works, it does what it's supposed to do. But then there's a bunch of people who end up in the container D Slack channel who are trying to build some crazy tool and doing really cool things. Those seem like the people, if we had the time or energy, you know, they're kind of playing in the code, so to speak. Um, but yeah, that's what I've been trying to think about. And again, you know, most of us are not, well, I, I can't speak for all the maintainers, but most of us have, you know, day jobs that aren't 100% driven to let's make container D a better community. So I, I don't know, that's an area I'd love to investigate is, you know, all these people that like container D as kind of this Swiss army knife API, you know, is, is there a chance to get them more involved? I think um, building some kind of outreach group for you all, it um, should probably be like a priority, um, whether it's outreach, whether it's like contributor experience, um, and it doesn't need to be, you know, 20 people, uh, you know, it could be a handful, uh, it even could be, you know, some of your maintainers who also already do this stuff to like bootstrap it. Um, but like Josh is saying, I feel like putting a putting a call out um, and explicitly saying this stuff. Um, like I watched your um, I watched your intro and stuff for KubeCon, and it was awesome. And I loved how you were talking about um, more contributors. Um, like the next intro that you do for November, because <laughs> it's right around the corner. <laughs> um, you should explicitly say this stuff. Say we're looking to grow the community in this way, like we need help with the following things um, and just be very explicit about your intentions, right? And see what happens. Um, I think building that out though, like whether it's like I said, a community manager um, would be super helpful. Um, and I can give you some like pros and cons. I can like do a doc for you with some pros and cons of kind of like each group versus like person um and kind of go from there all right yeah that sounds good i mean we've been we have a, a zoom channel we've been looking to utilize it to start something regularly but yeah. i can i think what you said by having something that's explicit around saying hey we're trying to grow the community in this way and we're having a meeting that's specifically about this yeah. um might yeah. invite the right people to come. I mean, maybe nobody shows up, maybe people do. And the thing is like, if you have to, you have to create the space for the work to happen, right? Just like a work work. Like you have to say like, here's this time and space that we're gonna talk about this specific thing. And that's kind of what we have to do with community as well. Like it's just one of those subjects where it's like, you know, you're gonna do the code and you're gonna do everything else first. And like, that's a priority. Um, but you need to create the intentional space for people to want to like come and talk about it and feel like comfortable talking about that thing there. That's a good point, Paris. And I would I would say it. You you said you don't have a mailing list. I would I would create one ASAP, um, just for the sake of like if you can't schedule a meeting yet because because your schedules don't allow it, at least you can start having that asynchronous uh, conversation uh, with people, um, and start generating ideas for what might be in those meetings so like community extensions and uh, maintenance with cncf type project or yeah. type requirements that sort of stuff yeah. yep and i was taking some notes too by the way so um container d folks i have some notes from and i think steven has some notes as well so um See y'all later on the flip side, Container D folks. Thanks so much for coming. I owe you stuff, and we'll, I'm sure, catch on the Slack waves. So. For sure. Thanks, Paris. Awesome. Thank you. All right. I'm also going. Sorry about that, y'all. I'm actually going to not the Container D meeting. <laughs> 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 Whatever meeting you're going to, I'm not going to that one. So I'm going to jump, but I still see Derek's on, so you might want to continue the combo. So uh, see you soon. Later. Yeah, we've been having a discussion about setting up a mailing list um, where 
in the midst of a few different things on, on that realm. But yeah, what we're trying to figure out kind of at the higher level is, uh, yeah, how we schedule these meetings and how we get the word out. Um, the problem with like mailing lists is they're, they're kind of hard to bootstrap. Um, to yeah. like I said. Yeah, I wouldn't start a new channel for this, honestly. Um, I would say start this discussion on whatever channel your users whatever channel currently has users on it. Um, the, um, and, you know, and if it's not, you know, if nobody's getting annoyed by it, honestly, keep it there because users tend to drop in and out of subscribing to things and having your users see an ongoing discussion on that channel about doing advocacy this or event that, or, you know, contributor documentation, this other thing, kind of gives them the idea that this is a place for them to participate, even if they're no good at hacking Go code. Yeah, I, yeah, I really like that idea. I think we're, we're definitely going to follow up on try to get something scheduled that basically where we can continue talking about this and invite the community. Um, we definitely have our Slack channels and Twitter for getting, I, I think we have pretty good reach from there. Um, but yeah, we use it kind of sparingly because well, that's just our style. We're not really loud vocal <laughs> in our style, I guess. Uh, so how do you announce releases today? I'm curious, or pre-announcements. Oh, I mostly use Twitter for that. Gotcha, gotcha. Can I make a suggestion about getting people to even know your mailing list exists? Because I've had to go through this a couple times. Because um, you've already got people like following you on Twitter or following you on Slack. Um, you may want to take advantage of a couple different places where existing users are and be shameless about mentioning the mailing list and do two things. One, repeat yourself. So like, don't just mention the mailing list once because people mute Slack. You know what I mean? They don't check Twitter for three months because Twitter sucks right now. Um, <clears throat> so like repeat yourself every time you do release, go, Hey, here's a mailing list or, um, Every time, you know, every so often in Slack, just go, hey, are you tired of like Slack being super noisy? Do you want something low traffic? We're just going to announce releases, interesting features or blog posts or whatever. And then the other piece of it is say what's going to be talked about on the mailing list, like what you're going to type of topics or things you're going to be pushing so people have a reason to sign up for it. So they understand why they'd like to and try to give them a little uh, push to go over there. Um, cause like a lot of people, like they sign up for your Slack channel, but then like 80% of them mute it, <laughs> things like that. So like right there, that may be like, that's why I think we got like everyone to sign up for the mailing list just for that. Cause the signal to work noise ratio is like so much better. Um, and just giving people things like this and then repeating it often cause people don't check these various places, like throw it on your readme, throw it in your release notes in uh, GitHub, put it in a whole bunch of places and you're more likely to to get these users that you've had for years, realize you even have the mailing list. Otherwise it's really depressing because you make it and you're like, ta-da, and then <laughs> you have like five people and they're all your maintainers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the other aspect is uh, there's, I notice a lot of the meetings are going into like a kind of mega CNCF calendar is is that what other projects and stuff are doing to try to get the word out when they do have events other than other than just like spamming people but like actually getting these things into people's calendars like what, what's the best way for doing that I mean I love the mega calendar because I can just look at it know everything that's going on in the CNCF world and then I don't have to like subscribe to five calendars. I don't know about anybody else. So, so I think um, 
I, I think part of it is also that as a graduated, you're graduated, right? As a graduated project, the CNCF provides things to you, provides resources to you, and um, you should try your best to take advantage of them because um, they're, you know, they're resources that are meant to solve exactly these kinds of um, maintainer issues, right? So um, being able to present yourself to the community, being able to, um, you know, there are some program management tasks. They do help with websites. Um, the I, I don't know if you're utilizing the CNCF uh, service desk right now. Um, yeah, so we do that quite a bit, definitely. actually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would I would totally subscribe to the the mega calendar. I don't always look at it, but if it's there, right, you can't say that it wasn't there. I guess. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Right? I mean, I'm not. I'm definitely not against the mega calendar. It's 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 really good for like discovering like new events and stuff. But I wasn't sure if there was any uh, for if other projects were doing a different method or if they had issues like just getting getting people to either subscribe to the mega calendar just for one event or uh, an approach like that. Um, so yeah, calendar wise, I'm, you know, it, it depends on what it is. If it's, if it's something that I'm actively contributing to, I'm probably going to be on like the mini calendar of the individual group, right? Um, but like knowing that, oh, Container D is having a discussion about this thing today, maybe I wanna drop in, right? And having that information kind of at, at hand. Um, another thing I would say about the, uh, the project phases, right? Is that as, you know, it, you know, for Kubernetes at least, right? A lot of, a lot of the documentation that gets generated um, across a, many of the CNCF projects, you know, they use Kubernetes as a template. And I would say that um, as a graduated project, people are also going to be looking at you uh, as, as a potential template for their processes. Um, so I would say to, you know, one of the, I guess one of the gentle asks would be like, think deeply about your processes, right? Because you didn't just get to a graduated state for nothing, right? You worked at it over several years. Um, so there are lots of good things in your process that, um, maybe they just aren't documented, right? Maybe like it just works so well uh, between the maintainers that you have that it's taken to be assumed, right? And that's something that could help a sandbox project and incubating project. So take some time to think about that stuff deep, deeply because uh, you are you will be the template for, for several other people. Yeah, I definitely realize that. Like we've, we've definitely looked at some of like the Kubernetes approaches, but in many ways like Kubernetes is, it's is just a project with a much larger scope. Like too big. We don't. <laughs> Container D is kind of in a weird spot because like we almost have like the same number of users in terms of like if you're running Kubernetes, you're probably running Container D underneath it. Um, but the scope of the project is so much smaller that while number of users will be high, like the number of people who actually like come down and like really care and get involved at this level, we expect it to be smaller. Um, but as the users grow and and become more sophisticated, we just see there's more and more interest. So that's why we're trying to scale a process. But we realize that like in some ways the process is unique, but in some ways like yeah, a lot of other projects are in the same kind of yeah. level. And I'll say from experience working on a lot of sort of back end infrastructure projects, um, I you know libraries basically because essentially it's what you are right in terms of your place in the ecosystem is container D is a library for the cloud native ecosystem. Um, what you're really looking for in terms of like a volunteer community manager, whatever, you're honestly looking for one or two people, right? You're not going to get a whole bureau um, because you never do for that kind of a project. But if you have one or two people who really cares about that and has some time they can put in and put in their 20% time, then that, will also probably be good enough. Yeah, I agree. I think we consider kind of CNCF as kind of that bureau or like that kind yeah. of larger body associated, but yeah, the number of like people involved like is smaller. And I think that's it. That's why, yeah, we're going to CNCF to say, or to ask for help in like generating these rules um, or yeah. in some cases, like just advice for like, documentation and stuff or almost stuff that, that could be funded as well mm -hmm. um, if we need that. Yeah, documentation, I think you might be able to get some direct help with because they have staff and a contractor network. But 
one of the things that I honestly think you need to do is, is that, that I honestly, that you are going to need is somebody who can be your interface for CNCF. As in CNCF is a bunch of people and from staff, they're good about fulfilling specific requests. You know, I need an X, but somebody needs to write up that I need an X, um, which is not, you know, it, it becomes time consuming if, if your list of things that you need, which it is, is, is extensive. Um, for a bunch of the projects that are primarily sponsored by Red Hat, I do that and, it, and it's a big time consumption, right? Even if the staff is, even if the staff is executing the actual item, um, uh, communicating what needs to be done, um, you know, particularly because you're communicating with somebody who has no prior involvement with your project, right? So, um, the, um, so if you say, you know, hey, um, our documentation UI needs an overhaul, they need a lot of information on how um, and on what you're actually trying to accomplish. Um, yeah, I, it, yeah we, we, we had a little bit of an exercise for that earlier in the year and unfortunately it fell through, but yeah, we had somebody who was interested in doing some documentation, but as contract work, um, but submitted something through the service desk and basically like the task was work with the work with the individual to come up with a very specific contract, which, you know, it's kind of out of my expertise in terms of like, I don't, I don't know what like this sort of like work contract looks like and like, like going through all of these like specifics. So yeah, help with that is definitely, a, I think, a, especially like experience with that. Yeah. I mean, Like we can in contributor strategy, we can help a little um, getting it started, but ultimately you're looking for somebody who cares about container D. Well, yeah, I think I think from from the standpoint of having people get uh, come contribute that type of work, not necessarily having to do the documentation, okay. but yeah. being able to actually like work with CNCF to like define what the documentation needs to be. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I need to drop pretty soon, a couple of minutes. So I'm going to drop in and actually give a, uh, a future attraction in here. One of the things, yeah, sorry, I joined late and, you know, hello, surprise. Um, one of the things that I'll be working on with the tech writer team is starting an uh, a meeting that's available for projects to be able to come in and join and talk with the tech writers and kind of get a sense about like if we were to be able to have a structure what would that structure look like and i think derek that might actually be uh something that would be helpful for you so watch this space for more probably like striking out in like september for that yeah that sounds great Thanks yeah I, I figured people will actually care about this but i'm like oh hey this thing that i've been working on this week you'll care about I will, I will now continue to lurk again. And Steven is Art. laughing at me for rising up out of the deep, like, hey, I got a thing! <laughs> oh. <laughs> yep. I mean, it was perfect, though. <laughs> no, yep. I mean, it is perfect, because, like, this came to me, like, Monday, and I've been working with the team, um, like, through, like, I mean, it's only Thursday here, but being able to, like, track towards, man, if we were to be able to have a touch point with some of our tech writers, we would have a better sense of what the projects need and what the tech writers are actually here for. Man, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, I, I think the, the frustrating thing about that, that interconnect is that, a lot of the times having having to write the documentation is one thing and, and and potentially farming it out is another but like a lot of the times you are the person in the best position to write the documentation or like dump things out of your head um and yeah someone without context on the project is is not going to be able to do the the same level of, of depth as, as you will um so yeah i that that can be a frustrating time when you have to sit down and do documentation, especially if you hand the task off, because um, this has happened several times uh, to me recently. Um, if you hand the task off and it's not clearly defined and someone who is not familiar with the area starts doing the documentation, uh, gets to the point where you're like, mm, it's 
taking me more time to do this review than it would have to actually do the documentation myself, right? And That's one of the things I'm kind of thinking about is what would happen if we put the tech writers in a position to be a better documentation coach about like, right, like how do you pair yeah. with like the, there's yeah. somebody else to be like, able to help keep you accountable, but you don't have to be able to make up the structure from scratch. You can just put in, hey, I know this thing. Well, I think the thing we'd want most from like tech writers, not to go too much into what this medium is going to cover, but like um, when people come in and contribute and then tell us exactly like what their frustrations were. Um, so like we've had people go through this experience and say like, oh, like I got container D to work, but it was way harder than I wanted it to be. And, you know, I wrote this documentation for like, here were all my frustrations and stuff. And, you know, like a, when a tech writer does that exercise, you know, it tends to produce really good results as well as show us where we need kind of that, that deeper technical, uh, like the design and architecture stuff, like that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I would definitely expect the maintainers to, to do, but in terms of like those documentations, like getting started and stuff like that, like the maintainers aren't the best people to do that because we're not getting started and we don't have a good perspective. So like, yeah, yeah, having technical writers go through getting started and be like, this is what sucks about your documentation. This is what like I couldn't find anywhere. Like, yeah, I, th I think as maintainers, we're definitely realize that's on us to like go and fix that. Uh, you mean Kelsey's old um, Kubernetes the hard way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. I, a lot. Yeah, go ahead, Josh. Well, no, and honestly, the the whole reason why he wrote that was to show everybody in the Kubernetes project exactly how hard it was to set it up from scratch and that that was something we needed to fix. The, um, as well as teaching people about the internals of Kubernetes and how the various pieces actually interacted, which is an important thing to know if you are going to be an expert. But, but a and, big portion of that was just to show what was wrong. Yeah, I, I, think, I think part of that is, um, is is information architecture, right? Making sure that the stuff that you need is actually in the right place. So like what's cool about that repo is like one, it gives you a very clear disclaimer. I think a lot of people use use it as, as law and they're like, why couldn't I do X? Um, and it gives you a very clear disclaimer that it's not something that's supposed to be done for production usage, right? It's, it's meant to display some of the building blocks of, of the project. Um, but what's really great about it is it does aggregate all of those building blocks in, in the same place. So like you're starting to think about that stuff and, and it starts to push you out into different areas to explore um, that, you know, as, as maybe a newer contributor, like I had mentioned this on a meeting and, and someone was like, I think it was actually uh, Celeste, who's one of the, the technical writers um, for CNCF, uh, someone to mention like, well, that's not where I would look, right? So like as a contributor, as a contributor to Kubernetes, like if I'm looking for something, my first step is not to the website. My first step is to like the community repo, right? Which is a totally different ingress point, right? And you may not know about that until you hit the website, but it, from the website, is there a clear way to get to the community repo? And like, so you start th thinking about like how people move through your process. Um, and, you know, for like SIG release, SIG release has its own repo for documentation, right? That like, we lead you from the community repo into our repo, right? Because we know that everyone who's focused and our, our maintainers, reviewers, approvers uh, on that content are going to be living in that repo anyway, right? Um, so like it's, I, yeah, I would say thinking about the experience, think about the maintainer's experience too. Um, there are some things that probably frustrate you about your process um, day to day. Um, those are those are things to start writing down too. Um, I would say that I do agree that container container D is kind of like cloud native API, right? It's it's the you know it's like the indirect module import right for for a Go project that you're thinking about. Um, so the I would look to people who are like if you take Dims as a great example, right? Who who kind of you know primarily works on the Kubernetes project, but also dips into Containerd because it's a dependency, um, uh, and see who of those maintainers or who of those like who of those transitive contributors would be interested in maybe becoming reviewers, uh, approvers eventually in your repos. Yeah, we do have Dims on board. He's been really, really helpful. Um, 
I, I have to drop off, um, but I appreciate everyone's time. And yeah, I actually got a lot of yeah, really thanks. good suggestions out of this. So appreciate it. For sure. For sure. Right, thank you. Later. Okay. I was going to go over some because we have a bunch of pending um, documentation PRs um, that people need to review in LGTM, but um, we have also lost most of the people who would um, review in LGTM those. The um, so well, I would say maybe we just shoot a note out to the list. There are four open right now. Um, looks like the what is governance one has quite a few comments on it, and um, just a request to do reviews, right? Yeah, I know that's one that I need to look at, and I haven't because life, but. <laughs> Same. Like, I'm like wagging a finger at myself. Um, so <laughs> like now that the, the, so um, I mean, most of my time was like Kubernetes 119 release and that just got out of the door. Well, that little thing. Come on, Steven, you can do that uh, in your but, sleep, right? <laughs> 18 weeks are, I think our <laughs> longest release cycle in recent time. So yeah. Um, have, you know, you might congrats consider, on that, by the way. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> Thank, thanks for getting that out. You might consider for your own sanity taking a cycle completely uninvolved. With these <laughs> Just a suggestion, speaking it's, from experience. It's, um, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, it's masochism, right? Like there's something that yeah. I really, really love about the, the um, I, I don't know, it's, it's it, beyond the technical. I think that we're, you know, we're starting to really get deep into some real process problems that have existed for a few years um, that are related to tooling as well and starting to like fix them. Um, so it's steady as she goes for a little bit uh, on, on, on that end. Um, like I'm hoping to kill an algo by uh, 120, by the end of 120. Um, but I think what I love most about it is that there, it's just like where you see a lot of contributors start like they get tossed into the fire of the release team and then you're like, ah, oh, now go free and go do this thing over here that relates to it. And then seeing that happen every cycle is just, I don't know, it's kind of rejuvenating. So, um, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're probably right. <laughs> yeah, given that, that like you're running for steering committee now too, so there, there are plans depending on, you know, depending on what happens, I have contingency plans. So. You can always come help us with the gonas. We're trying to, you know, get everything working with Kubernetes 1.16. So if you want to go back in time, you know. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> um, so I will say that um, if you're on, so what's the project called? Gonas. It's the game oh, okay. servers on top of Kubernetes. Oh. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So if you're, um, I, I will note that uh, we're planning uh, August 28th, tomorrow is the cherry pick deadline and the final release for 116 will be uh, September 2nd. Um, so okay, cool. A heads up that Good to know. is Good starting to, know. to move, out, move to end of life. Good to know. Da, da, da. <laughs> 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 okay the um yeah but if we can get those um let's see. Do, do, do. review the things there are yeah get them merged these, yeah, these are four. all advisory documents yeah they they you know they don't have to be perfect um as long as there's nothing egregiously broken about them we should just go ahead and get them merged The, um, oh, uh, Carolyn and I also tagged you on another issue, um, which is in the DevStats repo. God. Me oh, or Steven? Gone. Sorry, Carolyn's gone. Never mind. Oh. The, um, so. Would you mind linking that? If it's, if it's for me or if whoever it's for, just. Uh, no, I didn't, but, but I'll share it with everybody here, which is yeah. just that. Um, when Dawn was preparing the uh, contributor health document, we realized that there was a rather ginormous hole in the data supplied by DevStats, which is nowhere is there a graph of your number of contributions or number of contributors, which, uh -huh. which seems like a rather major omission. And I, 
I spent a long time in the dev sets thing saying this, there must be something like this somewhere, but there actually is not. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, that'd be really good. Because she was referring people to the overall CNCF dashboard, but that just gives a current count. It doesn't right. give trends. There's no ability to break it down into different segments. Mm. Um, the, um, so um, the, and, and the reason why it's not there is it's not, it was not considered a useful graph for Kubernetes for various reasons. Um, and um, the, um, because mostly because honestly, we're not in Kubernetes, we're not worried about tracking our overall number of contributions because it's yeah, always it's, huge. Exactly. Um, and, it, and it's usually pretty Kubernetes centric. Anyway. Right. And, and so, so most of the CNCF project dashboards were just covered, copied as a subset of the Kubernetes dashboard. And I think here we're seeing one area where that is not the correct path. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. But I want everybody this touches, including Dawn and Lori and Carolyn, to actually sign off on the definition before Lucas does any work on it. Since what I don't want to do is create a chart and then have him delete it and create another chart. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's just no. always anytime if you need to request something with dev stats for contributor growth or whatever, um, always make sure that Lucas knows when you're still discussing something because he will just go and do it. Do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So do we so. have um so one interesting thing, it's 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 we don't have we don't have time for it. Our our enough people for it. Um, but the con uh, the conversation about the Istio steering committee um, that cropped up on the TOC list. Yeah. I know that that's, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that this is the place to have that discussion. Um, well, I mean, I'd like to, I was planning on actually inviting people to the governance work group meeting on yeah. next Tuesday yeah. because it's where we discuss those things. I am just really not clear at this point what Alexis uh, wants um, because I was like, you know, if this is your whole thing of let's have projects have a steering committee instead of meeting other governance requirements. I'm I, like, I'm I like, think I'm it opposed was... to that. And he was like, no, that's not what I want. Yeah, I like, think. What are you recommending then? Yeah, I think. I would I think... just like to know what the TOC wants. That I've been wanting to know that for a while. <laughs> yeah, I think it was a lot of people just talking over each other in that thread. I think what we want is to have the conversation, right? Is it a good idea? Like, is it a good idea? I think is one of the questions on the table, right? right? But didn't the TOC is, already, what a good didn't idea. they already review the steering committee proposal and vote no? Not in a public meeting, as far as I know. Amy, do you know this? Oh, I think we've lost her. She's probably Doing two different Because I, I just thought that it had already been resolved that they decided to not. I thought it was in one of the threads where someone okay. had said, like, no, so they decided to not mandate it. It is not actually resolved. This is currently an open discussion item. Beg pardon. Sorry, I was yeah. mute. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I guess there's two different there's two different issues. Number one is, should the CNCF recommend that all projects have a steering committee? That's question number one. Um. And the question number two is, um, if a project does not have sufficiently varied maintainers, is having a varied steering committee sufficient to meet graduation requirements? So there's actually so, two sort of separate questions. Yeah, so, so to me, I think, you know, part of it is I, why why would we even look at a steering committee like why would you even look at a steering committee if like we we're still thinking about what it means to be a maintainer right so even yeah, like right. The, the the earlier discussion with with container d um you're saying like this is a graduated project right and with a lot of potential um that are concerned about overall project health right and and it sounds like part of that path is building building reviewers, building approvers. It's the same problem we have in Kubernetes, right? Building, continuing to build those the, those people across the ladder. Um, that's what would seed the discussion for a steering committee in one of those projects. I don't see, like, I, I think it's like, is it a good idea? Do we have, like, do we have places where we need to fill it with more structure? I think a lot of these projects do not have that requirement right now. Um, so it, it should not, I, I don't think it should be a requirement personally. Yeah. Well, 
I I also like the Istio steering model was done for a specific reason. Yeah. yeah. I wrote it. Um, it is, it was designed for, so this will always be my baby. Um, it was designed for, you know, the, to reflect the fact that there were going to be these corporate, you know, companies that are, they're contributing devs. And here's a spot to ensure that those folks will always have a say in like marketing and the administrative ops kind of stuff. So I don't see that being a solution to the diversity maintainer issue. Like that's to me that I, I don't think that a project that had that kind of a steering model would somehow pass graduation if it still was just one maintainer company. Um, because those folks that are on steering, for instance, I was on Istio steering when I worked on the project. Would I be able to keep the project going if every other maintainer decided to like move to an island? No. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, um, so, so, so hang yeah. on. I, I, I know we want to say more stuff, but we're past time. Yeah, we're okay. time. Um, yeah. And yeah. It's so um, I'll reopen it. But one of the things you should know, Stephen, because I know you're aware of this. So we had an entire meeting about this governance working group meeting about this. Um, and um, Alexis was invited and chose not to attend. Um, and out of this meeting came our recommendation to the TOC, which is that we said, we didn't think it was a good idea to recommend that all projects get a steering committee. Um, it's appropriate for some projects and not for others. And that we recommended against using um, steering committees to fulfill the multi-organization requirement. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, because cause our attitude was, if the maintainers all work for a single organization, it doesn't matter who the steering committee works for. Um, the, um, and, and it would make it harder for the CNCF TOC to understand what was going on with the project. Um, the, um, uh, so, you know, and, and I'll admit that I have a significant amount of impatience with him specifically because <laughs> we invited him to discuss it and he was not interested in discussing it. We asked him if we could use his write-up in contributor strategy documentation, and he said no. So this is not a dude who is interested in collaborating. I think we should reserve some judgment, especially on a recorded call. Um, yeah. I think that's, <laughs> I you know, yeah. I I think that I think that discussions on the TSC list have a tendency to to get, depending on what it is, has a tendency to get yeah. pretty heated. And I was, you know, it, you know, kind of, kind of getting ready to pop the popcorn when I saw the, the Istio steering committee <laughs> uh, uh, subject line. So I was like, I need to read this later. And, <laughs> but overall, I think it, 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 it is a discussion that should, should happen here, right? Um, if it's, if it's governance, that's cool. If it's, if, if it's us making a recommendation, it should eventually make its way to this meeting or to some recommendation on our mm -hmm. um, our repo, um, to because ultimately, like what we're here to do is kind of help the TFC divest some of the energy that they take in fielding those requests, right? Yeah. Um, well, if, if you look at the if you look at the leadership document that we have there, um, Dawn wrote in her own words uh, recommendations around steering committees. You know, mostly it's that it's appropriate for some projects to have a steering committee. And here's you how you know in a very short version of here's how you would go about Do getting one that yeah thing. right and um, I, I think that you know if we haven't done it already we need to make very clear that our our discussions and recommendations that we make are exactly that uh, mm -hmm. recommendations this is something that we're you know we run into in um, we like we want to help but we don't want to be on the hook, I guess, for a failure of one of those recommendations necessarily. <laughs> um, so it's it's something similar that's happening with, you know, if you take the, the Kubernetes working group naming, right? Where it's like, we want to make a recommendation that gets approved by steering, right? Um, and, and, and that becomes like, well, okay, now how do we execute that recommendation across the project, right? As opposed to 
well, this body of four people decided that we were going to change all the language in the project and what's going on with that, right? Because we get a few questions like that and you, we have to make it very clear, like we are making recommendations that, mm -hmm. that eventually will hopefully get approved by, by higher body, right? Um, so I want to make sure that we have a bit of like a, a lever <laughs> to step back from a recommendation. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, one of the things we haven't resolved is where the TOC approved material is going to live, right? So far, we're just putting everything into our own repo with the idea that everything in our own repo are works in progress. Gotcha. Um, yeah, yeah. And one of the open questions that we have open as an issue in our repo is, where's this? Where are the pieces of material that the TOC approves going to live? And and nobody seems to have an answer for that. That's the same thing we have to do for naming too. we're yeah. like okay we're gonna keep it in this little subdirectory that we have but like my personal feeling is that it lives alongside the style guide right yeah. or something contributor guide mm -hmm. um documentation so it's very clear that it's like okay this is a recommendation that has turned into law or something or a, mm -hmm. the general <laughs> suggestion for the project um so yeah that's uh, it's it's tricky it's tricky but i also want to make sure like it's not entirely on our heads once we make certain <laughs> recommendations. Yeah. Um, okay, anyhow, we are we are over. Yeah. I know you'll probably have to run to other yeah. meetings um, and great discussion in general. Uh, love talking with y'all. So catch yeah. you on the flip side. Bye. Later. Bye.